Hi everyone, this is Coach Carol, and I'm really pleased to be here with today Joyce Seitzinger. And I'm going to ask Joyce to briefly introduce herself before we run through our introductory slides. So over to you, Joyce. Hi everyone, I'm Joyce Seitzinger. I sound American, but I'm actually Dutch. Um, I consider myself a Dutch Kiwi in that I lived in New Zealand for five years, but I'm currently living and working in Melbourne. I've uh, worked in higher education for the last eight years as an e-learning advisor and e-learning learning designer, and, have, uh, and I'm currently focusing on social learning. And I think most of you might know me from Twitter. I'm as at Cat's Pajamas NZ. Thanks, Joyce. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we've known each other for some years now. And we really like the idea of you living in our country now. <laughs> we know where you live. Let's do our usual bits here and thank our Aussie Live sponsors and supporters. And so I listened carefully to the way Peggy was doing the intros today and she did a super job. And so I want to make sure I do a super job here today. We really like the idea that Blackboard Collaborate through Steve Hargaden has provided all of the rooms for our presenters today. And we've had several going, some concurrently, as you know. So it's been a bit busy down the corridors. Our team, well, what can I say about Australia E-Series team? They are awesome. Thank you so much. Our major sponsor is CIBA or Cyber Academy. We thank them for coming on board this year. And of course, Shambles and I are really happy in the background to be supporting this whole system, as are all of our other team members. And of course, we're actually inviting you to join the Learning Revolution project, which is at www.learningrevolution.com. And uh, they are a major partner for Aussie Live this year. And we're really hoping that it will continue into the new year and we can invite more people and get even more runs on the board. So we started off with our map and for those who've just entered you might like to do the same unless you're on an iPad of course where you can't actually move that around. So someone needs to put a smiley face in Thailand for shambles and uh, a WA one for Michael, but they're in place. And what we did earlier is we put a, a world map symbol into the place that we'd like to be. So that made a bit of a difference to our map today. Thanks, Shambles. Thank you for rushing over. I know you just finished your presentation. So let's move on now and move into pattern recognition digital identity, digital curation, and digital badges from Joyce Heitzinger, uh, academic tribe. You'll be happy to know, Joyce, that we've got lots of tribes from Aussie Live with you today. So take it away. Thank you, Carol, and, uh, and thanks to, to, to the Aussie Live team for making this all possible and for asking me to come in today and, and talk about this. Um, it has been really good to move to Australia and, and be able to work and learn with the people that I used to just kind of admire from over the ditch. So it's been absolutely lovely coming here and finding such a welcoming uh, education community. So, um, so thanks for that. And um, for those of you who are just joining us, don't worry, I've, I've got a little bit of preamble so you can just kind of like settle in, make sure that, you know, you say hi to everyone in the chat room, etc. Um, now, I also know that I actually know quite a lot of people who are in the chat today, so um, uh, so it would be a little bit like talking to old friends, so I'll try to keep it quite informal as well. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about pattern recognition today and basically look at two things that I've been talking about quite a bit over the last few years, basically since kind of 2009, which is digital identity and digital curation in e-learning and, and more widely in education. Um, but, um, but quite recently, like this, this new kind of thing has come into my horizon called digital badges and open badges. And, and for me, that's really kind of completed a, a part of the puzzle that I was missing. So, um, so, so today is a little bit more about, it's a little bit about my kind of discovery of all of these things as well. And, and, and their ideas that I'm, that I'm still developing. So, um, 
I'm happy to take questions and to respond to to any comments as well in the um, in the chat. Okay. So um, just a little bit more about me. Um, uh, my name is Joyce Sightseer. Like I said, I'm a Dutch Kiwi living in Australia currently. Um, up until right before Christmas, I was working in uh, a, at Deakin University here in Melbourne, but I have now left the university in order to uh, set up my own company at Academic Tribe, uh, which is all around building and learning uh, digital literacies for uh, educators and also focusing on open badges. Um, and uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can at joycetsinger at gmail.com. Uh, but, uh, but the place where most people get staying in touch with me is on Twitter, where I'm at Cat's Pajamas and Dead. I've been on there since 2007, and I've got about um, uh, 8,000 followers on there. So I spent quite a little bit of time in there. Um, and before I went into higher education in New Zealand and Australia, I was living in the Netherlands. And I was also working in e-learning, but that was more in um, corporate training. So a long time in e-learning. And, um, and uh, what I added there is that I also kind of consider myself to be a little bit of a pattern recognizer. Now, for those people who aren't familiar with the idea of pattern recognition, um, there is a wonderful book. If you're into sci-fi, and in fact, you don't really need to be into sci-fi because it's only set like a few years into the future, there's a great book by William Gibson called Pattern Recognition in which the main character, Case Pollard, is what they call a pattern recognition expert. And, uh, and what she does is she's got an incredible feel for the pulse of, um, of what is happening in the world. And, and she gets hired by really big brands and really big companies in order to see whether a particular product that they're thinking of bringing out or a particular um, uh, um, you know, brand or logo that they're thinking about is actually going to work or not. She seems to have like a sixth sense for whether these things are going to work, and that's because she's really finely attuned to her society and society that she lives in. So it's um, it's called pattern recognition. It's a great read, um, but um, but I think the reason it spoke to me when I read it, and I only read it last year, it actually came out shortly after 9/11, and 9/11 actually features. Uh, in this book as well. But I think the reason that it spoke to me is that I think like all of us are now engaged in this idea of pattern recognition. There's so much information around us and there are uh, so many ways that we can connect with people that, you know, like we've, we've all kind of had to heighten our levels of pattern recognition so that we can continue to make sense of things. And I think there are various ways in, in which we do that. So um, for me, that really started while I was living uh, while I was living in New Zealand, and so where I was working was at the Eastern Institute of Technology, which was a polytechnic, and my role there was e-learning advisor. But I was the only e-learning advisor that they basically had on staff. There were about 350. Um, staff members. Uh, yeah, it's a great book, Peggy. Definitely get it. Um, so there were about 350 staff members. Later on, that expanded to about 500 staff members. And I was the only e-learning specialist uh, there. And it was quite rurally located as well. And, um, and so I started work there early in 2007. And it was in late 2007 that I, that I joined Twitter and several other social media platforms. And um, what I found there was that um, my job, really, as an e-learning advisor to all of these different schools and all of these lecturers working in different contexts. So I supported the nursing lecturers, and I supported the lecturers in horticulture and wine science. You know, that included chemistry lectures, um, collision repair, hairdressing, et cetera. These are all contexts that I don't really know a lot about. And so really, my job as a learning designer all along uh, has been to kind of work with these people and very quickly see what the pattern of their context is. Very quickly see what the pattern of their 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 teaching is. You know how they how they interact with their colleagues, how the how the school works together, et cetera. And um, and when I started to go on social media, I actually found that that actually was something that helped me to do that better because. What would happen is I would work with a nursing lecturer, and then I would go online, and I would look for other nursing lecturers and other nursing schools, maybe in the States or maybe in Canada, who were doing similar things. And then I'd try to kind of map what it was that they were doing to our context and see how that could work. Um, and that was great, because it helped me to understand the context of the people that I was trying to support. 
Um, but increasingly what I found was that it then still required me to make those translations for them. And uh, what I thought would actually be better is if I could help the lecturers that I was working with in order to start building a digital learning network of their own so that they would be able to detect the patterns that were happening in their context, in their area of specialty, and they could start applying that in their own context. So it wasn't so much having to all go through me as the connecting person, but they would actually be able to do that themselves. Um, and I found that that was really the best way that I could contribute to, you know, the aims that the institution was trying to was trying to go for, which was, you know, providing really excellent blended learning. And so I started to look at how I could support them, and I've continued to do that really over the last, um, you know, six to seven years. So. Um, an example of this, for instance, is last year when I was working at Deakin University. So what I've seen is my, my role has really changed. My role has changed from being a trainer, somebody who tells people how to use the learning management system, which in our case was Moodle or uh, Desire to Learn, and that my role has really become a coach in digital literacy, digital identity building, and, uh, and other digital skills that, that, that the lecturers need. And so to give an example of that is last year, um, the researchers at, uh, at our university, and we were working together with Professor Deb Verhoeven, who led this project called Research My World, in which we tried to encourage the uh, researchers at Deakin University to go and crowdfund research funding. So rather than putting in a grant with one of the government agencies, uh, what they would do is they would go on a site, uh, this is an um, Australian site called possible.com, uh, but you might be more familiar with sites like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which are really big in the, in the United States. And uh, we supported the researchers in going online and actually setting up a project for themselves and start to ask the public for donations. And uh, there are a lot of things that go into a really good crowdfunding campaign, but part of it is having really good digital skills and being able to kind of get <laughs> the mighty maggots. They actually did really well, and they did make their targets. They were more cuddly than you think. But um, uh, they, the, what was really interesting about it was that we were working with these academics who were also teaching academics, and none of them really had much of a digital footprint. And, uh, but once we came, you know, but they were all very willing to give it a go, you know, and, and were very willing to kind of take this opportunity to, to learn these new digital skills. And, um, and what we found was that in doing this, they went from having almost like no, you know, Twitter identity or no Facebook um, community to having a really active uh, Facebook community that they could actually, for instance, one of them, the ones that you see here, would you like seaweed with that? That's Alicia Belgrove, and uh, and she was able to actually build a community and a Facebook page that is still growing today. And uh, not only was she able to meet her uh, campaign target, but she was then also able to turn that around and use the people who had joined her Facebook page to come in and help her with research because she needed research participants to actually taste the seaweed. So. Um, what we then found was that in the weeks leading, or, or after that, is that the lecturers, having learned all of these skills, actually started to think about, hey, how can I use this in my teaching? Because it's all fine to do it for this kind of one-off, but now I've got these newfound skills, and how am I going to use them for teaching practice? So it was a really interesting, uh, interesting uh, project, and my role in that was really to coach the, the, the lecturers and, uh, and, and help them think through what was going to work for their particular, uh, for their particular project. So, and one of the things that I always find is that, is that, that we kind of start with is really this idea of digital identity and who you are when you, when, when you, work, when you are online and where do you live, you know, when you go online. Now, um, I'm going to struggle here a little bit, and I'll tell you why. It's because um, <laughs> Carol and the team have restricted us to only 30, um, to only 30 slides, and I found it really hard. I said to Carol earlier, I found it really hard uh, because I'm used to kind of having lots of different slides and them prompting me for what I want to be telling you. But, um, but I'm going to make the best of it today and try not to skip any of the things that I want to share with you. 
So, um, so one of the best places that I find uh, when I start talking to lecturers about, um, you know, their own digital skills and their, their digital literacies and where they live online is to ask them the question of did, whether they consider themselves a digital visitor or whether they consider themselves a digital resident. Now, uh, you might be familiar with the um, idea of uh, digital natives um, and um, digital immigrants and digital natives. And, um, which is a Mark Prensky model, and really that, that uh, work by Prensky has actually been debunked in several different studies. There is no such thing as a digital native. There's no one who grows up just knowing how to use this stuff. And, um, and David White and Alison Le Cornu in their, in their, um, uh, First Monday article really coined kind of this new way of thinking about it and, uh, and, and, and think about yourself instead of being either a digital visitor and digital resident. So how do you think about that? Like what, like, um, you know, how do you make a decision about whether you are? I know some of us consider ourselves, you know, like we'll say like, oh, I'm definitely a digital resident, but are you a digital resident in every single platform? So, um, Dean Chiresky, uh, who you might know, he's a he's a he's Canadian educator. He um, he kind of has this kind of hard and fast rule, which is if you generally think of the internet as a place to look up up stuff, then you're missing the best part. And so basically, if you generally think of the internet as a place where you just go to find a particular thing, then um, uh, then you would basically be a digital visitor. You go there, you do what you need to do, and then you leave again. Whereas a digital resident is someone who would actually, you know, hang around, talk to other people, kind of as we are all doing here today, and um, and, and interact with others and, and consider that a place where you actually are. However, there is a more nuanced um, side to that. And, uh, and so what David White, who coined the term digital visitor and digital resident, is doing uh, in his research at uh, Oxford University is they are getting people to map where it is that they actually live. So uh, what I've collected here on the slide is a number of uh, different maps that David has been, has been producing with his team at Oxford Uni. And uh, what you can see is that everybody draws where they, where they live, digitally speaking, um, on a spectrum, or actually on two spectra. So as you can see, the, uh, the horizontal axis uh, goes from visitor to resident, and the um, uh, the vertical axis goes from personal to institutional. And because the way that we use Facebook is not the same way that we use Ning and the, or the same way that we use Twitter. And um, the way that I use Facebook won't be the same way that Joe uses Facebook or that Carol uses Facebook. So, um, so what they are trying to do with the, with the mapping exercise in this research is to actually start to detect patterns of how people, you know, organize their digital spaces, the places where they are, the places where they express themselves when they go online. And um, I've, I've included the link there to the blog post because obviously we've only got a short time here, but it is a fascinating blog post because one of the things that David does in that is he will show you how to map where you are yourself. Uh, but he's also recreated basically this slide that you see here. And um, and uh, and then what he does is he highlights where Facebook sits for everyone. And you can see just how different it is. Uh, some people definitely use Facebook across the entire spectrum from personal to institutional. Um, but other people only use Facebook as an institutional thing where they might, you know, run a, a Facebook page for their organization, but they do, don't do very many personal things on it. So it's just fascinating. And of course, what happens is that as the research team gathers all of these ma maps, they're able to digitize them and then to start to detect patterns uh, of where people live when they go online. So it's a really interesting exercise to do for yourself as well, I think, uh, just to get a feel for where it is that you live. And, uh, and also another interesting thing, if you read Dave's uh, blogs and, and the papers that are coming out of it, is that a lot of people live in their email, uh, which is a little bit sad. Um, um, and I myself, you know, I live across many, many different uh, different platforms. Um, I've embraced Facebook. It's very much a personal thing, um, although I do share interesting tidbits that are professional, but 
that I know a lot of my friends would be interested in. Uh, Twitter is very much a mix of professional and personal for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but do you include your email in your PLN? And I think your email is a live stream in your in your personal learning network. Um, so I've got Twitter, which is definitely a mix. LinkedIn, I really haven't done much of, but um, now that you know I've set out for myself and I'm and, I'm, and, I'm, and I've started my own company, I've definitely found that um, that I'm finding different things there and different kinds of connections than I was on Twitter. And, uh, and increasingly, Google Plus is starting to kind of come back in my estimation, whereas it has completely dropped off to me before that. So, um, so, but one of the things that um, having these different platforms allows you to do is to actually kind of think through, you know, how you want to express yourself in different platforms. And it can also help you to kind of distinguish between um, uh, what the research often calls collapsed contexts. So, for instance, you know, I've got my friends, and I might want to share with my friends all of my ukulele lessons. But on Twitter, I may not want to do that because I don't necessarily want prospective clients to hear all about my ukulele fumbling. You know, so like those kinds of things are are what we call collapsed contexts. And of course, if you're an educator and you're working with students, then that is something that you'll be really aware of. But so many of the educators that I've worked with, you know, who start to use Facebook or might be hesitant to use Facebook as a teaching tool. Uh, because they say, well, you know, I don't really want to be friends uh, with my students. And that is very much that, an, an example of that idea of collapsed context. And, um, and so what you quite often see is that people actually start to kind of make a difference and try to, you know, kind of untangle that role confusion by uh, saying, oh, I'm going to use, you know, one platform for one part of my identity for my professional, and I'm going to use another platform for another way. But what we're really seeing is that, you know, people are trying to separate those concepts and trying to separate those roles. And so I'll be really lucky over the last few months because I've been working together with um, uh, with Catherine Cronin, who's at Catherine Cronin Online, and Jane Davis, who's at Jane Davis 13, on a symposium around online identity. Um, and my particular paper, uh, which we're presenting at the Network Learning Conference in Edinburgh in April. And um, uh, um, so my paper is on social curation and, and, and digital identity. But I became really fascinated with Catherine's topic, which is actually around the um, the different identities that people take on, whether they're in the learning management system, which he calls a, which he calls a closed context, or when those same actors, so the teachers and the students, uh, are acting in an open environment like Twitter or Facebook or another one. So um, uh, I'll just tell you. So I'll just quote two things from that. So Catherine has just started to share some of the work that she's been doing on that, and uh, and I'll refer you to her um, to her blog for that. But basically, what we can see here is that example of you know people behaving very differently in classrooms and in learning management systems from the relationships that they have um, when they are in an open education context, and um, and. And sometimes that is actually, you know, kind of guided by the fact that there are so many restrictions in place in the learning management system. And just think about, you know, who gets to share information in the learning management system uh, and who gets to express themselves. Uh, quite often the person in charge of that is the lecturer or the lecturer together with the learning designers or a group of lecturers. Um, but it's actually the um, – uh, but in the open space, so say that you go into a tool like, for instance, Scoop It, um, all of a sudden, everybody or Pinterest. Let's let's choose Pinterest as, a, as an example. You know, everybody can set up pin boards. Everyone's got the same rights to create new pin boards and to share information. And uh, and so what Catherine is looking at is how that then influences how people express their identity and how people build an online identity. And uh, and so um, one of the things that she's looking at, particularly with her own students as well, is the fact that they've already got confident social identities online. Uh, you know, they will have been on Facebook. Uh, and, and, and on Pinterest and, you know, WhatsApp. Uh, but they need to develop those identities as learners and writers and scholars and citizens, and that, you know, we need to be helping them do that, but not just in the learning management system, which is a closed system and which they will leave uh, in, in, in the foreseeable future. 
So, um, so definitely, I can highly recommend Catherine's uh, Catherine's work on that. Okay. So um, that's as much as I'm going to kind of focus on uh, on digital audience because I'm aware that we need to get through quite a few things. Um, uh, and the next thing that I've really been working on is this idea of digital curation. And um, and curation has become a very hot topic over the last few years or so. And um, and so that's one of the things that I'm doing my PhD on. And it is um, it is something that I'm focusing on around you know how differently do people interact and express their identity when they're using social curation tools rather than um, some, say something like uh, Twitter or, or or LinkedIn, which is much more about uh, you know profiling um, uh, your personal identity. Uh, curation tools are not so much about that. Curation tools are much more about sharing artifacts and sharing resources. Um, so one thing I just wanted to focus on uh, here is the idea of because um, quite often people talk about digital curation, people talk about content curation, and what I've coined here and what we've seen more often as well is the idea of social curation. I just want to make a distinction between those. So uh, when we talk about content curation, that is basically almost like a blanket term of just you know any kind of sharing of resources, of digital resources online. And uh, but quite often, if you do a search, like if you do a Google search for content curation, what you'll often see is that it is also closely linked to this idea of marketing and search engine optimization, um, a way for people to kind of maximize um, you know ad views on their website. So it, it has a little bit of a CD side to it. Um, and then when I started to, to kind of research my topic, what I found was that a lot of the information that was already out there around and that, that often quoted digital curation was actually about um, more the digital curation side and the digital archiving kind of work that people like librarians do or people who are, you know, uh, who work with knowledge management systems. And so this is very much about um, finding artifacts and finding entire data collections and keeping them safe for future use. And uh, not particular, not with a particular audience or a particular user in mind, just making sure that they are searchable, that they are digitized, that they are, you know, uh, um, that they can be find, found, et cetera. And so, but it's very much about, you know, like it's, it's the work that a librarian or an archivist does in order to keep that collection accessible. And so what we see people doing every day online, your friends who are sharing interesting links, you know, online, uh, on Facebook, uh, your colleagues who are sharing interesting things on, on the Yammer network in your organization, that isn't really digital curation because we are not doing that in order to, you know, keep a collection for some future date. Um, you know, for the entire organization. And so um, so what we're seeing is a little bit of a refinement of these terms, and including the term social curation, uh, which in my paper us uh, basically talked about as the discovery, selection, collection, and sharing of digital artifacts by an individual, but for a social purpose, such as learning, collaboration, identity expression, or community participation. And so I've, I've added that little uh, idea about, you know, the, the process and how you step through it. And um, and basically what we then see is that people can use different tools uh, in order to set up their own process. So most people, you know, all people who do social curation will go through these steps, but they will use different tools in order to do it. So if you've got an entire collection of artifacts, and, you know, the artifacts here in this case is basically the World Wide Web, um, you know, for discovery, different people use different rules. So some people, you know, their entire discovery tool, like an, an inexpert learner just starting out of the university, you know, uh, a major discovery tool for them might be their learning management system, in this case Moodle. But for an experienced learner, you know, mature learner, somebody who's been working and is now going back, you know, the learning management uh, system will be one part of where they discover new learning. Um, but other, they may have other places like Twitter or Facebook. And, uh, and of course, what we're seeing is that new tools are coming out all the time. So the two that I've included there that I find really uh, useful for, um, for discovery are Zite and Flipboard, which are two um, iPad apps. And uh, particularly Flipboard is highly uh, customizable. You can basically set up any kind of search that you want. Um, but an important part of what happens in that discovery phase 
is that not, you know, you set up your information streams. And it's a good idea to, you know, when you're working with your students or when you're working with colleagues, et cetera, to also get them to actually start thinking about these different phases that they do and to think about what they do. So, for instance, what I, what I found last year that I was getting completely overwhelmed by all of the different sources. And, and that's because I was kind of curating indiscriminately and I didn't really have control over what I was visiting and, uh, and, and I hadn't really kind of streamlined uh, my topics and I hadn't streamlined the information streams that I'd set up. So in the discovery part, you definitely set up your information streams and you also choose the topics that you're going to focus on. Um, and so for me, for instance, that's around digital identity and digital curation and currently open badges as well. So that's what you do over there. And, and in a way, it's almost like a little bit of mindfulness, you know, you deciding that I'm going to focus on this topic. It's a little bit like, you know, when you're trying to get pregnant and all of a sudden you see pregnant people everywhere. It's a little bit like that. You know, you decide that you're going to focus on a particular topic and all of a sudden you see it everywhere. But now you've got a way of actually managing that because you set up a curation process for yourself. So the next step of the, of the curation process is the, the selection, and that's you choosing whether something is actually going to be interesting or not and whether you want to keep it. Uh, then you put it into a collection, and that might be a collection that you keep privately, um, like, for instance, Evernote is a, it would be a pro an example of a private collection. Um, or it might be something uh, that you keep semi-private, you know, in a closed environment, like, for instance, your learning management system, and uh, I've added Moodle here as an example of that. Uh, so adding something to your course site would be a way of collecting it. Or it might be on an open collection in a place like Pinterest or a place like Scoopit. Um, and then finally, there's a final phase. And, and sometimes these phases happen at the same time. For instance, when you're collecting something into Pinterest, you're sharing it at the same time. Um, but, uh, but it's a good thing to kind of think about, you know, am I collecting this just for me or am I collecting it because I'm also sending it to a specific audience? Um, and so in order to share it, um, you know, you can share it to Facebook, you can share it to Scoop It, you can share it into that curation tool that you're thinking about. Um, but one of the other things that we're seeing is that some of these kind of discovery tools that were only at the beginning of the curation process are now starting to add those kinds of uh, functionalities to them. So for instance, in Flipboard, you can now also share into other spaces, but you can also start building a collection in Flipboard and that people can set up their own magazines. So um, so those, those curation tools are increasingly expanding in order to cover the entire curation process. So basically, we interact. Um, we interact with people and, uh, and, and, and we express ourselves online on various platforms like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, the learning management system. And then we also interact with resources and digital artifacts through our curation processes. And, um, and what I realized that with those two things, they actually fit together and they, they, they work together in order to create uh, what we've now come to know as, you know, your personal learning network. So um, Alec Coros has done a lot of work about um, uh, on um, the network teacher and uh, you know what the network teacher does and what the different platforms is where the network learner where the network teacher uh, exists. You know, basically acknowledging the fact that you know the traditional environment of the network teacher hasn't really changed, um, but that there are now all these other places and platforms and tools where they interact with with colleagues. And um, and if you you know if I go back to the beginning of my uh, of my talk, which is that what my role was in in, in teaching um, our lecturers and in advising our lecturers, it was that I simply couldn't be you know the person who knew everything about the nursing lecturer for for the nursing lecturer and in their context, or everything for the chemistry lecturer and everything about their context. And so what I was really trying to do is to actually coach them into becoming this kind of a network teacher, so that they could you know help themselves very much. And um, and what I found is in trying to coach them there is that um, if people are completely new to these kind of environments and to this kind of thinking that, you know, it would be really good if you could show them some examples and also if you can start to kind of coach them into thinking about where it is that they live and what they do. And um, and what I found was that people think about their personal learning networks in very different ways. Some people, some people think about their 
personal learning networks very much about the tools, you know, and, um, and, and which tools they use. You know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Flickr, I'm on YouTube. But other people think about it very much about the people that it allows them to connect to. So, um, uh, so what you see here is another slide by Dean Shuresky. And he basically put all of the people in little lab codes because he talked about how um, he, um, uh, you know, like he basically considers all of these people his little research team, you know, and every single time he logs on on the Internet, you know, they found all these amazing things for him that he then gets to make use of and learn from. So, um, so there's different ways of thinking about uh, your personal learning network. And the interesting thing, of course, is that, um, you know, we all have the same building blocks at our disposal in order to put a, learn, a personal learning network together. You know, basically, you need to be connected to the Internet. You need to have access to the tools on the Internet. Uh, a mobile device is very helpful, and you need people. But after that, you know, you can put that together in any way. But I think the, the you know, the mindfulness practice and the focus of it and where it actually starts to become useful is once you actually start to think consciously about how you are going to put that personal learning network together in a way that it is doing what you need it to do, but not distracting you from, you know, your daily practice and from what from, from your work. So it doesn't become too disruptive. And uh, and I found that that's where a lot of, the, you know, of course, I was very passionate about Twitter. It made sense for me. It 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 suited my personality, it suited how I like to talk to people, I'm very chatty. So um, so initially, once I started to coach the educators that I was working with, you know, I was trying to push them all onto Twitter. And, um, and of course, that wasn't really working for them. And because <laughs> and, a lot of people said to me, oh, you know, I don't want to be on Twitter, then I have to go through everything, and, um, you know, I just, uh, it just, it's just too much for me, and I thought, hmm, what is happening here? And I started to try to think of a way that I could help the lecturers that I was working with out in building their own personal learning network by giving them a little bit of a framework to start thinking about, you know, how they wanted to, to, to build it and how they were going to use it. And I just thought about basically translating it into the context that we're all already familiar with. So, uh, you know, if you're designing your personal learning network, you know, you're basically building a little bit of a filter for yourself, a way to make the web manageable for you and to get the most out of it. And uh, and so, really, then you've got, like, four different spaces that you kind of want to focus on, which is, you know, your staff room, uh, which is where you talk to people. So, for some people, that might be Twitter, but for other people, you know, that might not be Twitter, it might be Yammer, which is more protected. It's like a company Twitter. Or it might be only on LinkedIn and, and just, you know, you're not even really talking to people. You're basically just connecting to them, but you're not really having in-depth conversations. Um, and um, uh, But then going to kind of the right half side of the circle, uh, you know, one of the other things that you definitely need is a filing cabinet, a place where you're going to keep things and where you're going to um, to keep things safe, where you store your personal digital collection. And again, there's no right or wrong tool for this, but important is it, what's important is that you actually decide what's going to be the right tool for you and for what you for what you want to do. You know, I often encourage people to not keep their bookmarks on their desktop and instead use something like Digo. Um, but, you know, in fact, for someone who works every day at the same computer and that is the only place that they work, why not keep it on your desktop, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's regularly backed up, et cetera, you're not going to lose control of it. Um, so it's all about making a decision, but it's also about, you know, those of us who like to play with new tools, et cetera, about, you know, making sure when we add a new tool to our tool set, to our tool belt, and, and, and that we don't overwhelm ourselves with, you know, well, where is our filing cabinet? I know, and this was definitely one of the problems that I struggled with, and I've now gone to my filing cabinet being basically uh, Evernote. It is Joyce's brain, yep. <laughs> so one of the other places that we then see is this idea of thinking about, you know, your information streams. This is basically a, mer a personal magazine, you know, a place where you go to kind of find information that's, to discover information that's relevant for you. And so what you then see is if we're talking about digital identity and digital curation is that the right-hand side of this diagram is really to do with your curation, and the left-hand side is really to do with your digital identity and where you live online. 
Um, and of course, there's a lot of overlap there. Like you might, you know, find something and keep it in a collection, but then talk about it on Twitter, et cetera. So there's a lot of overlap. But I think it can really help for people to to start to give themselves a framework for thinking about their personal learning network. And um, and so I use this model in order to talk, you know, to coach the the, the academics that I was working with. Um, but then I got invited by uh, one of the people at our learning center to come and talk to them, and also to some people from other learning skills centers um, about, you know, how we could use this for our students. And I thought, oh, actually, it'd be quite good if I could map this in a way so that. It had questions, you know, to go to in, to help you actually plot this out. So, um, so and and to kind of make it more universally uh, usable. So instead of talking about the staff room, I actually talk about the conversation. So, you know, where who are you talking to and why are you there? So, who are you connected to? Which tools do you use to communicate with other students? Are the tools public or private? What are the advantages of using the tool that you're using? You know, what are the disadvantages? And how much do you share about you? Like, how much private things do you, do you, um, do you, are you willing to share? And so uh, I basically kind of mapped it out there, and, and you can go through this, uh, you know, in your own uh, in, in your own time. And I've also created a a printable kind of handout. So if you wanted to use it with your students um, or with colleagues then, uh, you know, this can be a really helpful mapping exercises for people to kind of think about, you know, where it is that they sit. Um, you know, if the digital visitor resident model gets a little bit complicated, this is more practical, you know, think about which platforms it is that you're using and, and, and whether they're doing the job for you or not. So, you know, like I said, I've been talking about, you know, several of those things for quite a while. and uh, and. Of course, we all encourage informal learning, et cetera, um, even though, you know, it's not always quite clear how it fits into the institutions that we work in or the work that those institutions, um, that those institutions do. And, um, and so even though I was, like, encouraging people to build their personal learning networks and become, you know, more digitally savvy educators, um, it wasn't necessarily being recognized by our, by our, um, uh, our organization, and uh, you know they weren't getting any kind of reward. Like there's, there's no kind of diploma in being a connected educator that that I could point them to. Um, and anyway, being a connected educator is such a complex undertaking that um, that can be done in so many different ways. You know that it would be hard to kind of issue someone with a diploma in being a connected educator. And um, and this is really where kind of the final piece of the puzzle has finally come in for me, and uh, and uh, which is around uh, digital badges and how we recognize the skills that people have. Um, so what, of, <laughs> what you see here is actually a, uh, a photograph of my diploma. So this was my high school diploma. And um, I went to an American high school in uh, Cairo, Egypt. My dad worked at the embassy in uh, in Cairo for a while, and uh, and and it's it's very fancy. You know, it's got the calligraphy, and uh, it's got um, it's got my full name. Um, it says that um, you know I have um, completed in a manner satisfactory uh, the courses that were necessary for high school graduation. It's on a piece of papyrus. Um, you know, being in Egypt and all. So yeah, it's a great artifact. It's a it's it's a lovely thing to have. But essentially, if I gave this to you, also <laughs> it tells you exactly how old I am. <laughs> um, but but essentially, if I gave this to you, it's quite mute. The fact is that in an in an American high school, you know, you get to choose uh, the entire court you know course package that you want to take. So whereas my parents were very aware that we were going to go back to the Netherlands, and so they made my sister and myself, you know, absolutely stick to our um, uh, second language that we had to learn, so we had to learn English, and we had to pick another language because that was going to be necessary for going back to the Netherlands. Um, they made us do math at the highest level. They made us do science at the highest level. At the same time, somebody who got the identical diploma to this, um, you know, could have just spend the entire last year, the entire 12th grade, doing nothing but sports courses or arts courses. 
And not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, what I'm saying is that essentially this document doesn't tell you much about what I did. Um, now, you can get my transcript, and that will tell you a little bit more. But even then, all of those things will be very siloed because I took, you know, advanced placement English, and, you know, so you can see that I got the advanced placement English, but you can, for instance, see that while I was doing that, I was also a very active participant in our theater program, which was all after school, or that I was also a varsity athlete who did softball. All of those things are kind of missing from it. And so basically the way that we're currently doing the big badges um, is actually not very informative, and also it doesn't transfer very well. And um, this is where, um, where we're seeing kind of the advent of digital badges. Um, you know, Khan Academy, LinkedIn, uh, Deloitte, and I have a very active badging program within their company. Um, and basically people are being endorsed and recognized for skills that they have or for participation or contributions to the community that they've done. And of course, another place where we've seen badges kind of come into play is in the idea of gamification in, in education. Um, one of the problems with you know, learning management systems or, um, you know, Khan Academy or, for instance, Deloitte setting up their own badge systems is the fact that these badges don't talk to each other. So I can't, you know, if I'm a student who did Khan Academy, I can't go to Deloitte and my badges will automatically go into their system once I join the company. Um, so it's not really transferable. They don't talk the same language. That's that's just one of the that's just one of the problems. The other thing that people often talk about is the idea of micro of this as micro credentialing, uh, but in fact badges don't need to be at a very small level. They can actually be at a very large level. They could just be a digital version of your big diploma, or they could be on a uh, on a very small level, uh, as in I participated in or I was a speaker at the Aussie Live series. So um, so the um, so what we're finding is that Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation, has actually stepped into the gap and, uh, and thought about this problem and have kind of thrown themselves up as a champion of, of you know, of trying to make these badges talk to each other and setting up an infrastructure that will actually allow, pe allow people's badges to talk to each other. Um, this is their, uh, their statement when, they, when you read about the Open Badges um, uh, project which is that learning today happens everywhere, something that we've been looking at for the last uh, 45 minutes, but it's often difficult to get recognition for the skills and achievements that happen, and that's where open badges come, kind of come in, making it easy for any organization to issue, manage, and display digital badges across the web. And so all of those skills that people are doing, all of that learning that people are doing in their personal learning networks through interacting with people, through having this digital kind of life, through the curation that they're doing, um, through the things that they are making and putting into their e-portfolio, there is a way now of actually accrediting and acknowledging and recognizing people for that. And, um, and, and they're called open badges. Now, people talk about badges as being very, um, uh, as being very, um, you know, very reminiscent of the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts, et cetera. Um, but basically, at its, you know, most, basic, what a badge is, is it's basically an image file. And that image file has particular information kind of baked into it. So it gets a name, it has a description, but it also has, it collects the criteria that somebody needs to do in order to be issued with that badge. It says who issued it. It says what evidence was given in order for that person to get that badge. It tells you the date that it was issued the standards that were used, so this is more of the technical things, and the tags that were associated with that badge. And this is basically the process that it works to. So, you know, someone like Aussie Live, for instance, uh, the Australian um, uh, educators, could say, we're going to issue badges for this conference. And um, I could then collect that badge. So in this case, you know, I could be the, you know, I could be issued with a badge. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> um, let's say that I'm the earner here at the center of it all. And what then happens is that that badge goes into what's called a digital backpack, an open badges backpack. Now, currently, my backpack is hosted with Mozilla. Mozilla have, to have um, set up the entire infrastructure, and they have set up an, a backpack that everybody can go and set up for themselves and where they can start to collect all of their 
all of the things. But the idea is, is not that Mozilla will be hosting everybody's backpack. The idea is of what's called a federated backpack, which means that other companies or other institutions can set up backpacks where people um, collect uh, what they keep. And, um, and so, for instance, uh, in Chicago, they did a big thing called the Summer of Learning, and lots of Chicago associations decided to start issuing badges for, you know, after school programs, et cetera, for people to actually start to collect these badges. And instead of all of those badges going into the Mozilla backpack, what people did is they went into their Chicago Summer of Learning backpack, and that has become for them the place where they collect all of these badges. Um, now, once you've collected the badge, there are lots of different places that you can uh, you can display it. So what happened was I got a badge last year for speaking at a conference in the UK, and then when I went into the Moodle Moot um, uh, site in Australia, uh, and I was presenting there, I was then uh, I then connected the Moodle my Moodle account my Moodle profile with the backpack that I had set up on Mozilla, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, all of the badges that I'd already earned went into that Moodle site. So the idea is to, uh, you know, award people for different skills, but also kind of make it much more transferable. So rather than all of these different recognitions sitting in different silos, they can now all be put into one place. And that way, the pattern of our learning and the pattern of our skills also becomes much more um, visible to somebody who's looking to work with us or someone who is looking to um, to hire us. And so that's what you see at the bottom, really, is, you know, an employer can look at this and see in one, in one kind of overview what it is that you've done. And then the really exciting thing about this, and this is where uh, Mozilla is doing, you know, some really interesting things. So, you know, we can facilitate informal formal learning. It can be for harder, soft skills. It can be issued by anyone, so not just institutions, but also other people. Um, but what's really interesting is that if the badges are all interchangeable and the skills are all interchangeable, yep, thank you, Carol, um, then one of the interesting things that will start to happen is that we will actually be able to see the patterns that people take through their life in their learning pathways. And this is a really exciting thing because just think about what we can find out once we have much more finer and more granular data about what people are learning and how their learning pathways take them into a particular career or take them into a particular life direction. Um, so the thing that you see here, the diagram that you see here, is uh, Carla Casilli's way. Um, and Carla Casilli is one of the people on the Mozilla Open Badges team, and she's got a phenomenal blog. So if you're interested in this, I would definitely say, you know, go, go and find that. Um, but basically what you see here is, for instance, like the purple or the, the pink thing, the pink silo in the middle, would be how we set up a typical, typical course. But that might not be how the learner moves through it. So, uh, so a very revolutionary way of actually kind of rewarding this kind of network learning that people are doing. All right, if you want to know more, you can join the Open Badges Australia and New Zealand community. I'll have information about that on the LD Live site, and I'll ask Carol and the team to share that with everyone. Our first community call is this Thursday, and we'll have two of the members of the Mozilla team joining us on that. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I think I've just got a little bit of time for questions. Thank you so much, Joyce. I was uh, fighting with my screens here. Too many open. Wow, what a journey. And there's certainly lots of patterns there. And you know, it's falling into place for me. All the visuals that you shared today have resonated so well. I now understand a lot more about how all of the badges will work. And I understand definitely about the pathways that we're each taking in our personal learning journeys. Let's see if we've got some questions. I'm going to open up the mic. And I've got one question parked here from Mandy, so we'll give that one in a moment. Yeah, this is where everyone goes quiet. <laughs> All right. Oh, <laughs> Um, this often happens. Um, the comments are coming through, absolutely fabulous. You've stimulated such a conversation that I would advise everyone to save the text chat for sure 
because of the yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and because I was seeing it come, I was seeing it go past, and I didn't have time to look at it. <laughs> no, I know it's so fast and furious. All right, we've got one question from Mandy for you, Joyce. Um, and yes. this is harking back to the learning management system, uh, specifically Moodle, and she's asking, mm -hmm. where do you envisage, envisage us moving to, or will it all be open? Yeah, I actually, I actually wrote a uh, wrote a blog post about this about two years ago, kind of thinking about well, what would it do? And I'm thinking that the the, the what we'll see is that the learning management systems actually become much more like. Um, Mixing panels, you know, if you think about a DJ as a as a mixer, I think what we're going to see is that the that the learning management systems will really become a way of kind of hooking up the personal learning network tools that you've already got, and then being able to mix them together. But also, you know, now that we've got the open badges, so I'll have to go back and expand on my blog post. Um, is that you know if I jump in and I've already got specific digital badges, you see, it's not just badges out; it's also badges in. So if I've already got specific badges that I've picked up somewhere else, then maybe I don't have to do certain clusters of information and learning. Maybe I can jump ahead in a type of RPL kind of way. So I think it's going to be really, really interesting, really interesting times. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, can we quote you on that? I like that as a little mantra, badges out, badges in. We've got a few of those that have happened throughout the days of presentations. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thank and you all. Lot. And I'm happy to talk more on Twitter. Yes, please, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Joyce. That was superb. And you did it in time. I am so proud of you. See, you didn't need those extra slides at all. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you for joining us today. It was a great audience and you really made it a very interactive, interesting, thought-provoking and engaging session. I'll now close the recording and just remind you, of course, that if you want some badges, we've got our own Aussie Live version. Definitely, I've got I'm an Aussie-holic. <laughs> and if you want to make sure that you keep some in your own portfolio and you've presented, grab this one for I presented. Let me just grab my pointer. Can't get it to work. And if you're a, an attendee, get that last one as well. So thanks, everybody. The sessions for the 5 o'clock our time, are ready for your engagement. So I'll close the recording and see you later. Bye for now.